Welcome to Black Muse, a podcast production of the Chicago West Community Music Center. Before we begin, a little about Chicago West Community Music Center. In 1979, a budget crisis resulted in arts programs being eliminated from Chicago public schools. Institutions in more affluent neighborhoods were able to bridge this gap with funding from parent organizations, private donations, and grants. Other organizations offered subsidized music programs, but programs in low-income communities were limited or became non-existent. Chicago West Community Music Center was formed by Howard Sandifer with a goal to provide high-quality music instruction and community performances that would help reduce the music-related achievement gap between minority and non-minority students and between economically disadvantaged students and their more advantaged peers. It would also provide scholarships for higher educational learning, foster a West Side community orchestra, acknowledge local talent, and place Chicago's West Side on the map as having a music conservatory for everyone and anyone interested in learning to play music. The organization is run by Howard and Darlene Sandifer. As a result of the hard work, complete support and dedication of the faculty, students, parents, and families, and of course the board, Chicago West Community Music Center has strengthened the community it supports and provides benefits that go far beyond music education and unique performance opportunities. Visit www.cwcmc.org to find out more about how we inspire artistic and cultural expression in Chicago's youth. Feel free to leave a donation at the website. From the Harlem Renaissance to the Black Arts Movement to We See You to BIPOC, Black theater continues to rise. I'm joined today on Black Views by the critically acclaimed in-demand director, Ron O.J. Parson. Ron O.J. Parson directed the recent world premiere sold out run of Relentless at the Goodman Theater, where he also directed Sweat and acted in Romance. He is a timely, he's a timeline community, he's a timeline company member where his credits include Too Heavy for Your Pocket, To Catch a Fish, Paradise Blue, Sunset Baby, and A Raisin in the Sun. Ron O.J. Parson is a native of Buffalo, New York, and a graduate of the University of Michigan's professional theater program. He is the co-founder and former artistic director of Onyx Theater Ensemble of Chicago and a co-founder and co-director of Right Man Go Productions. Parson is a resident artist at Court Theater and an associate artist with Teatro Vista and an associate artist at Writers Theater. Since moving to Chicago from New York in 1994, he has worked as both an actor and director. Now we do the long form for our first time guests, which Mr. Parson is today. His Chicago credits include work with the Chicago Theater Company, Victory Gardens, Goodman, Steppenwolf, Chicago Dramatists, Northlight Court, Black Ensemble Theater, Congo Square, Northlight Theater, Urban Theater Company, City Lit Theater, ETA Creative Arts and Writers. Regionally, Parson has directed shows at Studio Arena Arts and Writers. Regionally, Actors Theater of Louisville, Milwaukee Repertory, South Coast Repertory, Pasadena Playhouse, Jiva Theater, Virginia Stage, Wilshire Theater, The Mechanic Theater, Center Stage, St. Louis Black Repertory, Pittsburgh P Public Theater, Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater, Signature Theater in New York, Kansas City Repertory, Portland Stage, Indiana Repertory Theater, American Players Theater, and Ensemble Theater of Cincinnati, among others. In Canada, he directed the world premiere of Palmer Park by Joanna McClellan Glass at the Stratford Festival. He is a member of AEA, SAG-AFTRA, and SDC. And if you want more information about Ron O.J. Parson, visit ronojparson.com. Ron O.J. Parson, welcome to Black Muse, where creatives from the worlds of jazz, hip hop, gospel, politics, sports, fashion, theater, and literature engage in the lively art of conversation. Hello there. Hello, Hello how are you? Nice awesome. to see you. 
<laughs> Ron OJ, 2022 feels like a hallmark year in your career, but I'd like to know where it all began. I understand you've been directing since you were 15 years old. How did this all begin? Well, I started, uh, I started in elementary school as a, as a kid actor, you know, uh, back when they assign you to parts. And uh, I always tell the story of my first part was I played the planet Mars. And my, my line was, I am Mars, the red planet, red like blood. And I like to have, uh, you know, a lot of blood in my plays, people. people <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, it started then. And then I got a scholarship to the Studio Arena Theater School in Buffalo, New York. I have to thank uh, Neil Dubrock, the founder of Studio Arena Theater, uh, for that because he did a search and he found some young uh, black kids in the neighborhood to offer scholarships to if they had some talent. And he felt I had talent at, at an early age. So part of that program was to direct and act. And so we all started, we all did it. We were 15, 16 years old and we, we started doing it. Then I did it in high school and uh, ultimately went to college for journalism. I thought I was going to be an athlete. I played uh, football and baseball, and I thought maybe I could be good enough to do that. But when I got to college, my uh, my I, you know the idea changed into uh, theater because I I heard some people practicing practicing. I heard them rehearsing a play, and I knew that play. I got cast in it, and the rest is history. Tell me about that. What play was that? That seems like a that was that was a day of absence, which was, which was a play that the Negro Ensemble Company had come to my school to do when I was in the seventh grade, and uh, Douglas Turner Ward with the Negro Ensemble Company had, had was on a tour of of schools in New York State, and uh, we were one of them. And um, you know, I fell in love with that with that play, and I got to do it years later. Um, you know a bunch of times playing the, the lead in that. And um, it was just, you know, something that sparked me to uh, to pursue my career in that field, but high school and then college. And, you know, one thing led to another, a guy named Robert McKee, who is now a famous uh, screen write, screenwriter educator on how to write uh, movies. He, uh, he was my first teacher in uh, at Michigan and he convinced me to to start to take it seriously. So that's mm. what happened. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Now, people in Chicago who know Ronald J. Parson, uh, really a lot of people will associate you with August Wilson because I would say that um, if I look at your career, I've certainly seen uh, several of your August Wilson productions. And I understand that you have to this point directed nine of the 10 plays in the August Wilson canon. Um, what was the first August Wilson play that you directed? And how does it feel to be known as the quintessential August Wilson director? Well, I don't think I'm, I'm known as that, you know, I just, you know, I've heard. There's, there's a few guys that have directed uh, a lot of them like that, but um, uh, uh, nine of the same of this at the same theater that is really it, really a great achievement and uh 30 all together i i did this one that's running now two trains running is my 30th august wilson production and i i'm really proud of that hopefully i'll get to direct all 10 uh at court theater i have been in all 10 i mean i've been involved in all 10 because i did act in joe turner's come and gone but I didn't uh, direct it, so I don't count that as a directing one. But I did. That's the only one you haven't directed, right? Joe Turner's Come and Gone. The only one I haven't directed, but again, I did act in it, so I feel like it's still a part of me. Now, we, are, we, are we eventually going to see you direct? Um, well, we're hoping to do that season at court, but uh, you know, nothing's, nothing's definite. The rights have been uh, locked down because they're doing a, making a film of it. So ah. they, they don't want people to play while they're still putting the film together. Now, you know, you're a humble man. I know that about you. And uh, you, 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 you know, you don't accept the compliments uh, too easily, but you really are known in many corners of the world as the quintessential August Wilson director. And one of the things that I hear when I talk to people about uh, how you approach August Wilson plays and how you um, earn this reputation is because 
one of the distinctions that people say about your August Wilson productions versus others is that you have a unique and uncanny ability to capture the essence of August. And, you know, there's something about the authenticity of his vision, his words, and what we see when we watch your production. Well, well let, let me just say, let me just say, I mean, that's because I, I was around the quintessential directors of August Wilson. That, that go, that's going way back, you know, not, not Lloyd Richards so much because he was the, really the original, mm -hmm. but Marion McClinton, who I uh, worked with on a couple of projects and watched understudied ones that he, he was directing and Stephen Henderson, Paul Butler, uh, uh, Russell Hornsby, um, uh, uh, people like that who were in the early days of the August Wilson plays, Anthony Chisholm, God rest his soul. These are people that because I was around them while they were doing August Wilson, I was kind of through op osmosis. Now, because so many years have passed since then, and I have had the opportunity to direct so many of them because, you know, when you get older and you're still doing it, you're going to direct a lot of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I use that and I try to remember what it felt like when I was around those productions of it with uh, being watching Marion and, and those guys, guys do it, you know. Um, you know, Kenny Leon has, has now done, you know, several and he's, you know, the Broadway uh, director and things like that. So, yes, I appreciate those accolades and I have done a lot, but I like to give credit to the people that I learned from to, to, to bring that essence of August Wilson to the plays, that spirit that is in there. You know, like they always say, you know, August is in the room when we're directing them. And I like to think that you know, when we, when we put them together. So I appreciate that. And, and, you know, granted, I have directed 30 of them, which is, which is a lot of plays by one playwright in any, in any arena. But, uh, but yeah, I just, you're, you're right. I, I just feel like, you know, giving the credit to the, those others that came before me. You know, when I hear you talk about those others that came before you, like Hornsby and McClinton and, and, and Wilson himself, I can't help but think about how you balance what many um, people coming out of um, uh, mainstream universities are faced with. How do you balance being in an industry where you predominantly produce or direct black film, black plays that speak about the history of black people and yet your training comes from mainstream university? What, how do you balance that? And, and what, how do you use what you learned from mainstream univers, uh, universities and incorporate it into a culturally specific uh, production? Wow, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever gotten that question in all my time of doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> that, 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 that's great, you know. Well, I, I give a lot of credit to being at the University of Michigan because even back then in the 70s, we were doing, you know, quote unquote, non-traditional theater. And it, it's about the training, you know, how to how to do things and how to bring, you know, characters to life and that kind of thing. Um, you know, using all of that in any realm, in any play is going to is going to be a good thing. You know, yes, I mean, I direct a lot of plays of my own culture, but our training wasn't that. Our training was all the other things, you know, the Chekhovs and the Ibsens and the, you know, Williams and things like that. But I always say great plays are great plays, great characters are great characters. And if you're a director, you you should be able to direct everything, not just, you know, one, one type of theater, you know, so musicals, comedy, you know, um, you know, like right now we're doing, you know, two trains running is running and you know, I'm going to be doing a play called Arsenic and Old Lace, which is one that we grew up watching that movie, that Cary Grant movie. That, yeah. But, but the, 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 the reality is, is that was a play first. And uh, I like to find, to be honest, I like to find, you know, I could be watching a movie and then seeing the credits that it was based on a play. And I'll go find the play and I was like, oh, wow, this is this is good. Let's do the original play. And that's something that we do at Court Theater, actually. We find 
we try to find when we do things, when we adapt things or whatever, we try to find the original source and go from the original source of the play to, to maybe adapt it to, the, to our stage. You know, so I feel, I feel that, um, you know, and I think that that's part of, um, you know, why we, we win awards and stuff is because of the way we, we, uh, we approach the, the theater and bringing it to life. Wow, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. I can't help but think also about you being at Court Theater. Uh, Court Theater is the theater at the University of Chicago here in Chicago, Illinois, and Black Muse is heard all around the world. Uh, we have an audience in literally Brazil and, and Peru and the Caribbean. And one of the things that people know about the University of Chicago, it is a very reputable school. What they may not know is the history that the University of Chicago has in the city of Chicago. It has a reputation that is known to ignore the community that it resides in, um, which is um, on the south side of Chicago. And I think you'll remember Bishop Arthur Ambrasier, who was the pastor of the Apostolic Church of God, where I was ordained and spent many, many, many years as a minister. But I worked with Bishop Brazier in the community. And one of the things that I worked hard on for many years with Bishop is holding the University of Chicago at bay so that they would not encroach southward any more than they already had into the black community because they were known for not really embracing the community where there are quite a few um, low income pockets. Now, uh, you're uh, someone who worked for you at the University of Chicago, Aaron Mays once talked about um, the community, I don't know the exact name of the, of the program, it's a community, uh, it's what your spotlight series comes out of. What's the name of that department? Well, the community. The community initiative, uh, community. just trying to do more in the community. Yep. Yeah, so that initiative is one that was started to help bridge that gap between the university and the community. And one of the things that Aaron said was that, you know, his biggest concern was that as the demographics shift in, in Chicago or the south side of Chicago, that his concern was to make sure that um, the culture of the south side of Chicago, that voice would still be heard through the university, through the Spotlight series. Tell me about the Spotlight series, because I got to tell you, you were in the newspaper, at least online, just a couple of days ago. Uh, Chris Jones, who's the number one critic in Chicago, did a wonderful story on the University of Chicago winning the 2022 Tony Award. Congratulations for regional theater. And I have to say that when I found out that the, the print edition of the story had a picture of the um, director and artistic director of the theater, but your picture was not there, it brought a tear to my eye. Now there's a beautiful picture of you with that story online, but in my view, when I saw that you were not pictured in the paper, it kind of mirrored that history that the university, in my view, still has an issue embracing um, the black culture and the black experience. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I don't know if I was there when they took that picture. I mean, I did get a call immediately when we won the award to recognize my uh, contri contribution to uh, that award and the theater. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't have the Tribune. I'm not a subscriber, so I don't know. I do like, you know, old school paper, but you know, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't follow that as as well as I should have probably. But I mean, I agree with you. Uh, the history of the of the university and uh, it is you know suspect like that. But I think that's changing, and I have to think. I've been there seventeen years now, and it has changed a lot. We we incorporate the the the, the community vastly in what we do now. Like you said about the Spotlight series, that's the thing where we go out into the community and we do readings now. In the beginning, it wasn't lo looked at as, as large as it is now. And now we actually look at some of those plays to bring to the main stage, um, which, I, which I did with some of the others. Like we did, uh, 
Leslie Lee's First Breeze of Summer. We did, um, you know, Wait Until Dark, which is not necessarily a black play, but we did it in such a non-traditional casting way that it brought about the community. So, uh, uh, you know, that that's happening with our new um, our executive director that we've had since 2018, I think. Wow, time is really fat flying. It was 2019, man. But, you know, COVID kind of shut us down for a couple of years. So, but... Uh, his, his attitude is totally, let's involve the community and what we do, what, see, what plays we do, what we do to in, in, entice and get the community involved. And that's happening. Since I've been there, it's happened. I've seen the audience grow from about 5% uh, BIPOC to about 40%, which is a big change, you know? So uh, I have to say that I, I agree with you. I, I'm always a little disappointed when, you know, uh, uh, some things are, don't look like they're, they're, they're respecting what's happening. But if behind the scenes, I do believe that, you know, the more it's more and more, again, since Aunt Hill has gotten there, I'm more and more involved in what's happening. To be honest, in the beginning, I'm, I was a freelance, which I still am a freelance director. So I was like, I really wasn't concerned that much with, you know, what they were doing. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go in and do my little thing. And then I'm gonna go out and do my thing in the, in the country. But now being being older, being more settled, I do appreciate uh, having the ability to, to help build that and bring that legacy to this university, which has had such a, you know, the, that, that stigma upon them. I mean, a few years ago, I won a diversity award with the university. And I was like, I was on a panel with some people who were in the Arkansas Nine and some other things, some protests. And, act, and I was like, wow, these people went to the University of Chicago. And I was like, I'm up here with these people because of what we're trying to do to bring diversity to the community and to the university. So I'm proud of that. You know, challenging I, was that in the beginning, like you know, coming to a place like the University of Chicago, knowing that you want to contribute and bring and speak and 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 have and share the black experience. How challenging was that? Well, you know, again, uh, again yeah. in the beginning, I wasn't concerned with that. I was like, my my career was outside that. You know, so I come in, do a play, and then I'm gone. Ooh. Now, when when I became a part of the university, yes, I did want to do more to make a statement to involve, because of course the plays that I was doing were quote unquote mostly the, the black culture. I wanted to have black people in the audience watching that, you know. So yeah, as I grew, as I got there and was there longer, yes, as far as challenging, it depends on who the leadership is. You know, at certain certain times it was challenging, but but once again, I have to give on hell a lot of credit. He 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 came to me and said, "Hey man, we want you involved more. You know, what do you want to do? What do you I want to?" Adore him, yes. And so and so that that changed that yeah. changed things, and it changed my attitude as well. But you know that that's just part of growing in this business. It's 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 a tough business, so. Yeah, it's interesting because you can go to a lot of these theaters and you have the uh, classics as they call them. And I know when I grew up, we had uh, I, black plays is what I saw. And there are many play titles that I could name that we consider to be classics in our culture. But those are not the plays that you see in mainstream theaters. That's uh, very true. That's very true. And that's yeah. one of the things that I wanted to the theater to show there are classics, not only in America, but all over the world by people of color. Mm. So now if you had to look back at your career, what would you say, and I know it's hard to say, you can't pick one play or two plays, and maybe there's a, a period or a certain theater that you were with, but what, when would you say you just felt, I'm a professional director, I am, working in this industry alongside? Well, that would be the first time I got paid to do it. <laughs> the, first, the first time I got paid to act uh, was, that, was that time. I mean, you know, early on, like you asked about the first play I directed by, by August, it was Ma Rainey's Black Bottom in 1992, where I played Levy, which is the lead character, and directed it at a community theater. But before that, I got paid in 1976, I can remember the year, um, I got paid to do a play called No Place to Be Somebody, mm -hmm. and to play the lead and go to a, a college as a guest artist acting. 
And I was like, wow. And I think I got six hundred dollars. <laughs> uh, um, and I was for that time. But it was, it was actually, but that was six hundred dollars for the whole thing, not not a week, you know. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I can get paid to do this, and uh, you know, it, it it felt it felt good, and. Uh, you know, from then I didn't look back. I just, you know, and granted, there was some rough times, you know, <laughs> at, at time that, you know, acting and directing, all that stuff is very hard, you know, to, to not do it, not have another like quote unquote regular job in this net. And it's been a blessing for me to, because I, I've been able to, to do this. I mean, I've had jobs, don't get me wrong, but I haven't had jobs that that have made me, you know, change and say, well, I'm gonna do this. I mean, my mother, my mother and father, both of them were like, you know, the post office is hiring. I remember when I when I saw that movie, Hollywood Shuffle with Robert Townsend, that that was the theme in that. His mother wanted him to get a job at the post office. Mm -hmm. and then at the end of the, at the, end of the film, he, he was doing a commercial for the post office and he had a, you know, the post office guy, but you thought, oh man, he, he's working for the post office. <laughs> But it turned out to be he was an actor in a commercial for the post office. That, that was actually a, br a brilliant movie about this business. It was great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, when you first get paid for something and you, you can do, like George Burns always said, if you can do what you enjoy, he didn't say it like this, but he said, if you're doing what you enjoy, then you'll never, you're never working a day, and you're never working a day in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, you like what you're doing. And I, you know, yeah. at this point now, because I've been doing it so long, it's like, I don't know, you know, what else to do. Sometimes people ask me, what would you do if, if you were doing? And I think I would still be in the sports journalism. I mean, because that's what I had gone to college for. And I'd probably still be doing that, you know, maybe photography with that uh, writing. I was, you know, a sports writer for University of Michigan Daily and things like that. So you know, I'd probably be still doing that because I'm still involved in sports. And see, your humility just always shines because a lot of people would have answered that question of, you know, when did you feel like you arrived or when did you feel like you, um, you know, were a professional director would have answered that when I, when I, when I directed on Broadway or when I was, um, you know, on Broadway doing something professional and you have been there on Broadway doing something professional. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um... Yeah, um, I was in a play because I, you know, uh, worked at Steppenwolf uh, a lot. And that that's a funny story, too, because when I first got to Chicago, everybody, they had that stigma, that that uh, stigma. Uh, uh, black people don't need to go over there and this and that. And I, I never, you know, gave in to that kind of thing. I, I said, well, and that's where I'm going to go. That's why I want to go. And uh, uh, Martha Levy, who was a friend, she took me in and she was like, no, we want to do these things and this and that, and we want to make these this this progress. And so I, I directed four shows there um, back when they only had one um, one company member, uh, K. Todd Freeman. And um, you know, it that was what you want to say about challenging. It was challenging in the sense that you were making, uh, you know, changing things. You were. Like I, I look at it like sometimes because uh, Jackie Robinson, what he did, and I feel like I've gone to a lot of these theaters as the first black director or whatever, and that's you know I feel like Jackie Robinson in that way. So, but going over there and uh, and and directing there um, and acting, that's I started as an actor there. Terry Kenny, you know, he cast me in um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Gary Sinise. And I, that, I didn't expect it, you know, I was like, I was just going to audition, you know, I was still trying to, you know, make my way. I hadn't been here very long. And um, I got cast in that and granted that took off. That went to Broadway, it went to London. I mean, that's the only time I've ever been to London was with that. And the only time I've been to Broadway was with that as well. It was funny because at that time I was directing more and I had directed a, an August Wilson play for Congo Square. Uh, their first play. They've been around now 20, over 20 years, but, um, and he was there and he saw it. And I had met him back at Yale before he was a name known director um, with some other friends of mine who were at Yale. And um, he saw it, he liked it. And he recommended me to direct that play at, in Baltimore at a theater. And I was on Broadway. I was, 
acting on Broadway when that happened. So it was like, what do I do? Well, August Wilson recommended me <laughs> personally, you know, and I and I couldn't do it. I, th I think back on it now, what if I'd have done that instead of do the, the Broadway show? But, you know, you can't look back on things like that. No, my, mother, my mother had wanted me, you know, I wasn't a real actor until I was on Broadway or a soap opera. If I was on a soap opera or Broadway, I was really doing it for real. Right. And, and uh, she unfortunately got too sick to come to the Broadway show. But I always tell the story, I, I got her a ticket and I bowed to that ticket at the end of the play oh. because I knew that's where she would have been sitting. And oh. uh, I was on Broadway, you know? <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, that, that was a big deal, you know? I mean, but you know, once you get on Broadway, it's just doing that's another play. Yeah. You, it's another job, you go to work, just like everything else. But you know, you made it on Broadway. It's on your resume. You yeah. Know? Like this Tony thing, this Tony we're getting, Court will now always be, be seen as the Tony Award winning theater, Court Theater. You know, the Tony Award winning Court Theater. You know, that's the thing, like with Academy Awards and stuff. Academy Award winner, so and so and so. You know, so that's something that's, that it stays with you for your career. Yeah, that's pretty major. You mentioned, you know, what it felt like turning down something for, um, that August Wilson wanted you to do, which um, uh, opens the door uh, for the fact that you had a real bona fide relationship with August Wilson. I mean, a lot of what you learned, yes, you learned from other directors who were directing that you were around, but talk a little bit about what it was like, you know, to be around. I happen to, and, and, and I want to just want to say this, I, I was looking at a photograph that um, was shown with the, uh, they're building an August Wilson house in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania uh, with a theater that's, you know, in-, in Well, it's his house. house. They're converting his house that he grew up to. Uh, right, into a tourist, not just tourism, but if there's a theater, et cetera. But there was a photograph of the original house that he lived in, and you could see the poverty that existed around that house and, and, and the, 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 the period that he lived in. And it made me think about you as a director, directing August Wilson and how, you know, you, when you talk about bringing August into the room and, and really, you know, when I see your, your August Wilson productions, I think about jazz and I know you incorporate jazz and other forms of music in your shows all the time. But there's something about jazz that makes me think about your productions because the way August Wilson writes, you direct that way. There's a rhythm. There's a flow. Oh, yeah. uh, again, that, that comes from him. But let me just clarify. I, I didn't know him as well as a lot of a lot of these these older directors and whatnot knew him. Uh, you know, Stephen Henderson, Ru Ruben Santiago, Hudson, Kenny Leon. They knew him a little closer because they worked in his place. I worked on the outskirts. I, I was an understudy in Jitney. I met him back at Yale. I met him you know, different times, you know, didn't get to hang out like I would have liked to, but we did have conversations when I was understudying uh, Jitney because, you know, understudies usually aren't around a lot, but I, in that case, I was there every day, you know, and he was writing, he was writing the play at that time. Mm -hmm. And and my friend, um, uh, uh, Alfred Wilson, who was at the Goodman at the time, became like really closer with August and I was able to ride that coattail and get the ride around. We did ride alongs and stuff. And we were able to talk about Jim of the Ocean because he was writing that and things like that. So it was like, I wish I had known him better, better than that. But it's funny because me and Steve uh, Henderson, we, we sat around before we, we were associated with August Wilson and we talked about, man, I hope I get to do an August Wilson play because he hadn't written <laughs> plays yet, you know what I mean? So it was like, oh man. And now Steve is seen as one of the top, you know, August Wilson actors, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, professors, and he knows all about them. I, I, I kind of like you said, known as as doing directing the plays, but um, you know, so it, it's it's just interesting that uh, I just want to clarify that he he was just great person to be around. Yeah, that's great. What role does um, faith and spirituality play in your work? Uh, well, spirituality—I uh, don't—I don't know if that 
faith. And say, yeah, faith that they're going to do the right thing, say the right words. <laughs> spirituality is just, you know, it's a very spiritual experience working on one of the plays. August Wilson with Aunt Esther, you know, and the, the spirit that's in there, that's happening, which is, again, what I try to incorporate, having that in the room. And yeah, like the ancestors. But exactly. Like you say about the music, that music comes to you, the jazz, the blues, whatever you're listening to uh, at the time, which which I tend to do that when I'm when I'm listening. The one where that's running now, two trains running at Court Theater. Um, there's a lot of jazz in that. We did King Headley the second last year before the pandemic, and that had a lot of jazz. And then, you know, Freddie Hubbard, Charlie Mingus, Miles Davis, Sonny Rollins, you know, I mean, you know, I just I like to go back to old school. You know, so when when old school jazz people come to the show, I say they know some of those some of those songs. You know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, then in this one it's the '60s, so we're we're incorporating with the music of the day. You know, the popular mm -hmm. music, of the day. but in the show it's it's a jazz experience. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like universities today are changing with the times of the say the BIPOC movement? Of you talk about your experience at the University of Chicago, having studied you know, the, the, the Caucasian classics. Um, do you think that Black classics and other cultural classics are being incorporated in these master's degree programs now, or is it- Well, so I, can't, I can't speak on other programs, but I can speak at the University of Chicago, and they are definitely doing that. You know, I mean, they're, we're, we're, you know, we're working on a, a Staples thing, we're working on, uh, you know, all kind. Of, I'm, I'm learning and I'm meeting teachers at the university that was like, you teach here? And then, yeah, I teach, so -so. I teach in a class on the, the, uh, the influence of Miles Davis and so and so and so. And I, I've worked with uh, 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 the musicians in the jazz department at the university as well, um, and was able to incorporate that in some of my music and work, I mean, some of my plays and work with the department. Um, uh, Mawada Bolden, who was a, a, a teacher there, I think he's still teaching here. He's the head of the jazz uh, uh, program. And so we use some of his students and some things. And I, I talked to him about some things. And, you know, I got to actually get in touch with him to see if he wants to come see this one. But, um, yeah, so it's a lot of like going on. In yeah, because I know there's always that conversation of cultural relevance. You know, if there's an actor studying acting coming out of a Caucasian school today, is he ready to... Well, you know, a lot of time before the before the recent movement, though, I did think that a lot of the black students, the, their culture was kind of stripped from them when they're learning about plays. Like I say, when I was at Michigan, we didn't do any black theater. We didn't do any plays. We did it on our own. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a friend of mine named Von Washington, he he was the one that incorporated me, and we had a black theater workshop. And so we did a lot of the plays. We we would just use the university facilities to do plays like uh, Ed Bullins and uh, Charles Charles Gordon and Ron Milner and people like that. That of course the university wasn't going to do, but we we were going to do those. And unfortunately, a lot of the black students coming out of these programs, you're right, they've never heard of the Negro Ensemble Company. Mm. That 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 trips me out. You know, yeah. <laughs> are you going to be an actor and not know the people before you who made the way for you? That's like a baseball player not knowing Jackie Robinson. You know, and fortunately, that's the case in a lot of times, a lot of places. Yeah. How much do you have to learn about, you know, if, if you're a musician, um, if you're a conductor, you don't necessarily have to know how to play every instrument that you're conducting. As a director, how important is it to know about lighting and sound and the acting and um, is well, it to learn that yourself or? Well, well, for me personally, no, every director is different. Some, I trust the, the creators that I pick to do that. Now mm -hmm. I, have, I have ideology of what I want, what I want to see, and they know, know how of incorporating how to make that happen. So that, that's, that's how I work. I mean, a lot of, a lot of directors are more, uh, you know, micromanaging. I, I don't do that. I let let them create just like I'm creating as we put it together. Like for instance, this this show that's running now the, the, with sound and lights, and we just sat there and we kind of put it together. We talk a little bit. Andre Plus and I, who who's uh, done a few shows with me, and 
we kind of just talk about what we want to hear, what what it works here. And then if we know we're coming from a jazz framework, we start listening to some jazz, you know, and, and fitting it in, you know. And, um, you know, so those kind of things. But uh, uh, act directors who have, are actors at, at first, they're different than directors who are just directors. That That's no doubt in my mind, because, you know, we have a sense of what it's like being on that side of it as well, which is, you know, a big difference, you know, when you're an actor, you know, mm -hmm. you're, doing, you're doing a lot of things different, you know? And so it, it varies to say, mm -hmm. but some people, some directors have been lighting designers or have been costume. I know some, some up in Canada when I was up there uh, doing the Stratford place, uh, the designers, usually the designers did both. They did costumes and sets or, or lights and sets or lights and costume. I mean, you know, it was it was doubled up up there. And uh, my show, I, I just said, no, I just want one for each. And I wanted to have, they, they wanted to give me the, the big time major player. I said, no, why don't you give me the young ones just coming out of school, just coming out or just working in the business and let's get them, get them up here in this thing, you know? So I always look at it that way. Mm. If someone gave you $10 million tomorrow, and you were able to just coast. I mean, obviously you're at a place in your career, you could, you know, tie it up, hang it on the, hang your hat on the shelf today if you chose to. But if someone gave you $10 million tomorrow and said, I'm giving you this money to make an impact in the arts, what would the first three things be that you would do? Yeah, that's another question I haven't really ever gotten before. Wow. It's that's deep. Well, for one thing, you know, it's just like I said, um, I had a program called Beyond the Stage, and we wanted to introduce young, by I say young black kids, you know, I mean, the BIPOC is, is the way it's said now, but mostly, you know, black kids, you know, uh, whoever minorities that wanted to get involved with what we were doing, um, you know, some kind of school or training in, in those arena of what you just said about technical theater. I would, you know, get something, get them out of high school or get them just before they go to high school, see if they want to learn this kind of craft. And there's more and more people of color designing now. Um, so that's a possibility. But, uh, and then maybe start a theater, have a theater that these kids could learn at after they get the training, then they have theater to work at, you know, and then, you know, probably just programs to get young writers. So the whole thing would be about the, the, the backstage of, of what we do and giving them a helping hand to, to get started in this business. Mm. How hopeful are you for the future of um, Black art in theater? Well, because I see more and more designers of color now, um, there's more stories being told on the stages, you know, I mean, just in general, you look at TV commercials now, you see a large, more uh, number, larger number of people of color in commercials, like we're actually part of society. So yeah. I think, I think, you know, uh, I think we're, we're, you know, in, in good shape as far as learning and getting and nurturing that I just, you know, I just hope that we can, maybe that can help you know, get some of the crime stopped because kids don't have anything to where to go, where to do. Maybe this is something that we can catch somebody before they get a gun and give them a camera or give them a, yeah. give them a lighting, a light, or, you know, yeah. on board or something, you know, and get them, get them off the streets and into the theater. <laughs> yeah, we're solving a lot of problems out in the world, but we don't seem to be able to have the will to solve the problems right here in our own backyards. Um, it is amazing. Um, Ron, just as we start to uh, wrap up, I want to ask you about your process. They talk about when you, when you hear actors, when you talk to actors and directors, everybody's got a process. Um, what is your process for preparing for production? And if I look at this year, I was doing um, some research on just what you've been doing this year. Literally, you're going from play to play and they're vastly different. Relentless was a Victor Black Victorian era play. 
Um, and, and the mindset you had to get into to deal with that play was not, a, not, not, not mainstream. And you go from that to two trains running and you go from two trains running to what, Arsenic and Old Lace or? Uh, uh, a musical with Felicia P. Fields. Ah, blues, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the variety of all of these different productions, what is your process that allows you to, you know, move seamlessly from one to the other? Well, I think because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Older. Older. I've been doing it a long time in a lot of different arenas, you know? Yeah. So you, uh, and again, I can't underestimate or understate my training at the University of Michigan because that's what we did. We did everything, you know? And um, we were able to find, you just have to recalculate whatever you're doing, but the bottom line is it's all theater. And the bottom line is, you know, I like to have fun while we're doing it. So uh, just staying relaxed and, and uh, calm, uh, you know, not letting, you know, we've had some, some situations where you know if you panic things are going to go wrong so you know just in life if you remain calm i think you you work things out and um, so you know process wise i guess just preparing for every individual thing differently you know so well you you you're an actor you're a director you studied journalism is there a play in your future with a byline, Ron O'Donnell. You mean, you mean, you mean writing? writing? Writing. Oh, well, you know, I've attempted, I've attempted to write different things, but you know, that takes a lot of time, and I, I really admire uh, writers, you know. But uh, I mean, I have stories, I have ideas that I can give to a writer. So we, we do, we're doing that at court. You know, our Nora Titone, her our uh, dramaturg, I've given her. Uh, ideas and we uh, eventually we will commission people to write those things and uh, you know maybe you know I have again I have a great idea of a play that I've been working on to write for years since college <laughs> and it hasn't happened but you know maybe it's a suspense thriller so uh, that's my favorite genre I don't get to do a lot of those but, uh, but that's what I want to do so maybe I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time that you've given us because really today is a very special day. And the fact that you have given us this much of your time on the opening night of Two Trains Running at Court Theater, we feel blessed. Do you, do you forgive us for <laughs> intruding on your opening day? No, I just, you know, it's just... It's just kind of relaxing. So, you know, I have to get, you know, get ready, but uh, to go, but uh, in fact, I got to get ready right now to go. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, if you had a piece of advice that you could give to young actors and or would be directors coming out of universities today, um, what would you tell them? Well, for one thing, I would just say you have to persevere. I mean, it's, it's not easy. And, uh, you know, some of these programs, you know, they don't tell you about the business side. Mm. They, they give you the training. And I, I think when I got out of college, you know, being the big man on campus with, like I was in, at Michigan with uh, David Allen Greer and, uh, and Reggie Cathy, who, who has passed on. But a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, people have gone on to big things. And so when you get out of college, sometimes it's not as easy as you think. It is when you're at school. And uh, so you just have to make that adjustment. You have to, I always say that um, if you want to be, you know, in this, in this business, uh, that that's one thing. If you need to be in it, that's a whole nother thing. You, know, you need to do it and you want to do it. If you want to do it and, you know, it's hard and obstacles happen, you, you just want to do it so you're not going to fight. If you need to do it, you're going to fight to keep doing it, you know, whether whether you make it big or not, you know. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. And there were a lot of periods of just, you know, community theaters and, you know, working telemarketing jobs on the side and doing all that. If uh, Alfred had uh, asked me, suggested I move to Chicago and Stephen 
McKinley Henderson also said, hey, yeah, Chicago would be be good. It was a big change because New York ate me up and spit me out, you know, and I left. I went back to Buffalo and settled in. I, I actually had given up on doing theater when I left New York. I went back to Buffalo and he, Steve got me an assistant job with him doing something. And then when he, uh, he got a movie or something, he had to leave. He said, hey, man, you're on. And I had to direct it. Uh, that that got me back into it because I I I had given I was working at Home Depot, and I was in the shipping department. I was like, "This is cool. I'm I'm, I'm good," you know. And then, so you know, things happen. I was like, "Yeah, okay, I'll go with you, man." And then the next thing, you know, stuck. It got my juices flowing. Then Ron Himes in St. Louis, he hired me, and then you know, some other things happened. Things just happened. Things don't just happen, things happen just. Ah, that's a famous <laughs> saying of yours. Well, it's Lorraine Hansberry. It's just Lorraine Hansberry. Ah, ah, speaking of a classic. Right, exactly. Well, Ron, you know, that's one of the things I love about Chicago West Community Music Center because they not only teach music, but they teach the business of music. So when kids come through their program, they really do come out well-rounded and understanding. And as I said before, Black Muse is for creatives from the worlds of jazz and hip hop, gospel, politics, sports, fashion, theater, and literature. Engage in the lively art of conversation. And I do appreciate the time that you've taken today to spend with me for our Black Muse audience. Is Great. there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners? Uh, I love those glasses that you're wearing. <laughs> My boyfriend bought these for me. Thank oh, you. Okay. <laughs> But anyway, thank you. And uh, no, I just keep doing what you're doing. And it's, it's great. It's a great thing. Thank you so much. That's Ron O.J. Parsons, the in-demand director in Chicago. Thanks, Thanks so much. See you later. Okay.